Two weeks ago, we talked about the first part of this lesson, so if you've forgotten that, I encourage you to go back and uh, revisit that sermon online, not because the lesson I preached so great, but because uh, this is taught by Jesus Christ. And so we covered the four that we wanted to cover two weeks ago, and we'll finish this up today. So if you didn't get a sheet that the young men are passing out, you'd like to have another one, feel free to take that. We call them the Beatitudes because it's not just something we do, it's who we as citizens in God's kingdom are. And so we practice the principles that are taught here in these Beatitudes, so we have to learn first what they are in order to know what it is we're supposed to do. And keep in mind from a couple of weeks ago, I said it was not surprising that a kingdom which began with the cross uh, should be full of other surprises as well. So in the first lesson, about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, we talked about the kind of kingdom that Jesus Christ would have. And then the first lesson in the actual Beatitudes talks about the kind of citizen that's in that spiritual kingdom. And so very quickly we'll go over some of these first four that we talked about a couple weeks ago. Uh, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and blessed are the pure in heart. That's the ones we covered a couple of weeks ago. And so there's eight of them, but we want to keep in mind that we've already studied those first four. In quick review, we mentioned that the poor in spirit refers to the sinful emptiness of the one who is spiritually bankrupt. He's poor in spirit because he's humble and he's no longer full of himself. And he's one who is disgusted with the sinfulness in his life and he realizes that he can't direct his own footsteps and so he's willing to come to God and serve him. We said more about that then. Blessed are those who mourn. That's a choice of suffering. We're grieving over our own sinfulness, especially as we compare ourselves to God. And so those who mourn their sinful condition, Jesus said, I will comfort you. And he said in Matthew 11, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And then number three, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Psalm said, All your commandments are righteousness, so to hunger and thirst after righteousness is to desire with all of your heart to do what God wants you to do to be right with Him. And so you have to study God's Word. But if you hunger and thirst for those things, then you'll be filled. And the word hunger, there's the same word Jesus used, or used of Jesus in Matthew 4 when he was hungry in the wilderness after 40 days of with, doing without food. So he's saying those who are starving to death for spiritual nourishment, their soul shall be filled. And then the fourth one, blessed are the pure in heart, referred to those who in single-minded devotion want to serve God. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, for you'll either love the one and hate the other. You'll cling to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And the miserable Christian is the Christian who does not have that purity of heart. He wants one foot in the kingdom of God and one in the kingdom of the devil. He wants to live like the world during the week and then serve God on Sunday. And so pure at heart, purify your hands, you sinners, and cleanse your heart You what? Double-minded. Make up your mind to serve the Lord. Now, these four were all connected because, as you can see, they have to do with our inner being. Am I humble before God? Am I sorry for the sins I've committed because I know how much harm to God? Do I want with all of my being to do what is right as God says what is right? And is my mind made up to serve the Lord as Joshua said, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If that's you, then, of course, these next four will come naturally as well. But keep in mind now as we go on to the second part of our lesson, here is the great paradox. The kingdom of God is not given to the mighty. If you're going to go out and take a kingdom in this world, you have to have an army better than the others. You've got to have soldiers who are stronger than the others. You've got to have the ability and the wisdom to dominate your opponents so you can take that kingdom away from them. But in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, it does not give itself to the hump, to the powerful, 
but to the humble. And that's the one who patiently yields to God's will and says, well, now, if it were up to me, I would do this, but God says do that, so I'm going to follow him. Even though I may not understand why I'm doing what I'm doing, and maybe not even if I understand why God wants me to do that. Think of Abraham when God said, leave your homeland and go to a place that I will show you. Abraham didn't say, well, give me a map and show me where I'm going and I'll go. He got up and left not knowing where he was going. Well, how do you do that? You trust in God. And we serve Christ in our lives, and if we're faithful in that service, we don't always know where we're going either. We just know we're headed toward heaven, but we're following God's instructions. And so we abandon our own rights for the rights of others. We saw that in our Bible class this morning, Philippians 3, uh, 2, verse 3, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. What mindset did he have? Though he was rich in heaven, for your sakes he became poor. He sacrificed for us. God so loved the world that he gave his son. He did that for us. We're to imitate that ourselves. And so if that's what we're trying to do in those first four beatitudes, blessings that Jesus pronounced, put us in that category so that now we can take the second part on and say, blessed are the meek, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the peacemakers, and blessed are those who are persecuted. And ask yourself, is that me? Are you meek? Are you merciful? Are you a peacemaker? And are you persecuted for righteousness' sake? Kind of interesting, isn't it? That's what we want to look at because these are the words of Jesus that I've already said. And he is the one that prescribed these things. Well, let's take a look at each of these in our lesson this morning. And, of course, what does it mean, blessed are the meek? I like the phrase I read many years ago as a young preacher where a writer said, meekness is not weakness. Think of who the most meek person in the world was according to the Old Testament. Moses, was he weak? No, he was a powerful, strong leader. But he was meek in the very sense of that word. Who else is meek? Jesus, come to me all you who labor and heavy laden, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. But he's not weak either. So when you think of meek, you need to think of someone who has power and ability, but they're able to control it for the better good of those around them. That's really what that means. And so it's the disposition of moral determination, keeping my powers and my abilities under control, and contrast that with the world, because in our world, we live in a place of harshness and cruelty. If you don't think so, just watch politics in America for a while. I mean, there's not a better description today of harshness and cruelty, and it doesn't matter what your political beliefs are. Everybody's violently attacking everyone else. Well, that's how the world does. We have to be careful we don't get caught up in that. Because in this world, the violent and the self-willed are the ones who are going to be in charge. That's the nature of the world we live in. The world doesn't know what to do with the meek man. He just can't understand. Blessed are the meek. They say meek is weak. And then it says, for they shall what? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And we say, well, what does that mean, inherit the earth? Well, the reason the world can't appreciate this, and the reason why sometimes we don't understand it, is because it's not a natural disposition. The natural disposition is might makes right. If I'm powerful, I can control you. But Jesus Christ said you may be powerful, but you don't control them. You control yourself. Solomon said in the book of Proverbs, the man who can control his spirit is mightier than he who takes ten cities. And boy, that's the truth. We worry about that person or this person or that group or this group. What we need to worry about is, am I in control of me? Am I being the kind of person God wants me to be? And so the gentleness of Jesus, the meekness of Jesus, did not save him from the cross because the world despised his meekness. 
And so meekness is not an inborn mildness of temper. Sometimes you, you see somebody and they're just, we call them meek. They're just kind of kind, easy, laid back, easy going. We say, oh, there's a meek man. Well, really what that is, that's just an inborn gentleness. There's some people who are just easy to get along with. If you cause trouble with them, you're the problem. They're, they're that kind of person. But that's not what Jesus meant here because that's more natural. He's talking about those who choose to be meek and what that means. And on the other hand, meekness is not bowing down to a dominant master who forces you to do something against your will. You know, my dad told me a story in the, about when he grew up in northeast Arkansas. A couple of bullies got into a fight, and one of them was stronger than the other one. So he just hauled off and hit the guy and knocked him down on the ground. I thought, boy, I'd like to see that fight. Can you imagine one guy hitting another fellow so hard he hits the ground? Well, the other guy jumped back up and dusted himself off, and he was ready to fight again. Well, the bully hit him a second time and knocked him flat again. And he got up the third time, and he knocked him down a third time, and the third time the fellow stayed on the ground. Now, would you say that guy who was whipped is a meek man? No, not at all. He was a defeated fellow, but he wasn't meek. He was just a bully who met his match. And so... Meekness is not someone who controls you and makes you do what you have to do. And meekness is not the guy who just gets along with everybody. So what do we mean by meekness? Well, we've said it's power under control. And furthermore, it is not indifference to sin. But in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus Christ was one who loved righteousness and hated iniquity. And so it was not, meekness is not indifference to evil. Sometimes we think, well, a meek person just, you know, watches somebody doing something wrong. He just sits there and takes it. Doesn't say anything. He's really meek. No. Jesus was meek, but he abhorred evil. He tells us in Romans 12, 18, abhor that which is evil and cling to that which is good. And so furthermore, we understand that this meek person is one who keeps company with the lowly, the kind, the long-suffering, because he's in control of himself and therefore is able to deal with the issues that life brings to him. And so really what we need to think about regarding this is this is the attitude of someone in regard to those around them. And think about that in contrast to blessed are those who are poor in spirit. That's the man who views himself in relation to God. Blessed are the meek. That's the man who views himself in relation to his fellow man. And so if you realize what a sinner you are in God's eyes, and you realize, as Paul said in Philippians 2, let this mind be you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who thought of others before himself, that's the meek man. How can you do that? Because you control yourself. You do what is in the interest of others more than yourself. And so that makes you a kind person, a long-suffering person, a forbearing person. The Bible's full of those passages telling us to do that. Ephesians chapter 4, Colossians chapter 3, 2 Timothy 2, Titus 3, 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 1. All of them say, practice long-suffering, lowliness, kindness, humility. And so that's how we deal with ourselves in relation to our fellow man. The meek man has had enough of himself, and he said, I do not want to be self-righteous. I just want to be right with the Lord. Because self-righteousness is spiritually destructive. The self-willed person is spiritually sick. Self-confidence and self-assertiveness is a stench to God. And so the meek man empties himself of himself and fills his heart full of God his love for his fellow man. But then we come to that second part that's so hard to understand. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And you think, well, I've never seen a meek man own a country, become a ruler in the world. Have you? This man who controls himself so that he can bless others around him, how does he inherit the earth? 
And you know, sometimes you have images stamped in your mind. The one I have in my mind on this passage is when I was a kid growing up, my mom and dad loved watching westerns, and I did too. And you could always, back in that day, you knew who the bad guys were because they wore the black hat, and the good guy, good guy wore the white hat. The bad guy was wearing a scra- scraggly little beard, and the good guy, he, boy, he's clean shaved. He'd, he'd use a razor every single day. And I'm sure that's how it really was in the Wild West a few years ago, right? <clears throat> but I remember this bad guy come to town, and here's this sheriff who's this mild, meek-mannered, easygoing, trying to get along with everybody. And this old bad guy rides up on his horse, and he says, Well, I see in the Bible it says the meek shall inherit the earth. So I'm going to let you inherit the earth. Boom, he killed him. And when they buried him in the ground, he inherited the earth. That's not what that means. So you think, well, that's what the world would think. Meekness is weakness. If you don't stand up yourself, you get run over, you get run over, you'll get buried. But what does it mean? Blessed are those who are meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Well, mark in the column of your Bible and read with me Psalm chapter 37, because that answers the question. Psalm 37, right there in that Matthew 5, where it says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Put Psalm 37 there, and then turn over and listen carefully as we read this, because it really helps you understand what it means to inherit the earth. And listen carefully. Verse 1, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace." The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees his day coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy, to slay those who are of upright conduct. Their swords shall enter their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous." The Lord knows the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed of the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows, shall vanish into smoke, they shall vanish away. The wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. For those blessed by him shall inherit the earth, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. He is ever merciful and lends. His descendants are blessed. Depart from evil and do good, and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever. But the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in it forever. You can read the rest of that chapter, but you can kind of see what God means by the meek shall inherit the earth. Do what is right and trust in God, and God will make everything that's wrong right one day. Be patient and let the Lord Avenge yourselves. Be patient. Let God punish the wicked. 
Be thankful that you're a righteous person that you have a future to look forward to. So if I were to summarize the, the beatitude this way, I would say, blessed are the meek, for they have a future worth looking forward to. And that's really what he's talking about here. So hopefully that will help a little bit. Well, if you're that kind of person, guess what's next? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I always ask in Bible classes and sometimes in sermons, when the judgment day comes, do you want to receive justice or mercy? And we always say, oh, I want to receive mercy because, I, you know, I haven't lived perfect. I've done some things wrong. I want to receive mercy. Well, guess what? Jesus said, if you want to get mercy, you're going to have to be a merciful person. A just, harsh judger of other people is not going to receive mercy from the Lord. Don't think you will because the harsh judging person is really the self-righteous person. And you see that in that parable Jesus talked about the two men. This Pharisee goes up to pray and he says, God, I'm thankful that I'm not like other men, especially not like this publican over here. He thinks he deserves justice and that God's going to say, well, well done, good and faithful servant. But the other poor fellow, the publican, smote his breast, would not even as much as lift his eyes to heaven, but said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, that man went to his house justified rather than the other one. And so we need to remember that when we get mad at somebody, we want to get even or we want to exact revenge, just stop and think, now wait a minute, do I want God to be merciful toward me? And the answer is yes. Well, then you be merciful toward others, even your enemies. Well, they don't deserve it. Do you deserve God's mercy? No. So you're merciful to others, not because they deserve it, but because God was merciful toward you. And so you show compassion. You extend forgiveness repeatedly. You remember how in Luke chapter 10 and verse 37... Jesus taught the Good Samaritan story. Who's my brother? The fellow who showed mercy and compassion on the fellow who was wounded and helped him out. Mercy extends repeated forgiveness because in Matthew 18, Peter said, How often should I forgive my brother? Seven times in a day? Well, that's more than most people do. Jesus said, No, 70 times seven. In other words, as many times as your brother comes to you and asks for forgiveness, that many times you extend mercy toward him. And we are merciful, as I've already said, because that's what God has shown toward us. God demonstrates his own love toward us, Romans 5, 8 says, in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. You see, we have to be merciful even toward our enemies because God was merciful toward his enemies. And then think about Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities to obey and to be ready for every good work. To speak evil of no one. To be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Beautiful passage on what it means to be merciful. Everybody around us is being hateful and spiteful and evil and mean and mean-spirited. If we're not careful, we'll adopt that attitude rather than the one that Jesus prescribes. So ask yourself, whose disciple are you? Are you really following Jesus? Or do you just give him lip service? Citizens of the kingdom live among their brethren as those who forgive because they are forgiven. As James chapter 2 and verse 13 says, mercy triumphs over judgment. So we get that, don't we? And blessed are the peacemakers. That's those who have first made peace with God and then they bring the gospel of peace to others as well. Now granted, if you're a Christian, you'll be peaceable. And you'll love peace rather than anything else. 
because your disposition is to look for the way to make peace. But really what he's talking about here, blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called what? The sons of God. So he's talking about spiritual peace more than anything else here. Blessed are, well, who are those people? Well, they're the ones who uh, demonstrate the doctrine of Jesus Christ in their lives and teach it to others. Look at Ephesians 2, 14 through 16, because there it talks about Jesus. It says, for he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. You ever stop to realize that the death of Christ on the cross made Jew and Gentile one in him? And so they're not only at peace with God because they receive forgiveness of their sins, but they're at peace with one another because they're all saved the same way. A Jew can't look down at the Gentile and say, well, I'm better than you because Gentile says, well, how are you saved? Oh, we're, uh, well, uh, let's talk about something else. Well, the Jew is saved just like the Gentile, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit, Titus 3, 5. We just read that. And so that's what Paul is talking about. Peace with God and peace with one another as we all are in the same fellowship. None of us should be self-righteous or overly righteous or think, well, I'm better than you because we're all recipients of God's mercy and grace and we can't earn salvation no matter how long we go to church or how many times we think we're great. So it goes on to say, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off, that's the Gentiles, and peace to those who were near, that's the Jew. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Well, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. The peacemakers are those who have made peace with God by obeying the gospel, submitting their will to his. Saying, I believe in Jesus. I'll repent of my sins. I'll be forgiven in the blood of Christ as I'm washed in the waters of baptism. And why don't you do the same thing? And so we all love each other and care for each other because we're all saved the same way. And so we read that in the Bible. Jesus Christ said in John 14 and verse 27... My peace I give to you, peace I leave with you, not as the world gives do I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. When you lay your head on your pillow at night, you stop and think, I'm glad I'm a child of God. I'm glad I've lived a Christian life, and if I am to die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. You should. If not, then you're not doing what you should be doing, because no Christian should go to sleep with a guilty conscience. But on the other hand, you never seek peace at the sacrifice of truth. You know, the world wants us to compromise and give in. And we can't do that. So we have to choose truth over everything else. And so the true peacemaker is one who's at peace with God because, as Romans 5, 1 says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're at peace with men as much as is possible. Emily's favorite verse, Romans 12, 18, as much as is possible, live peaceably with all men. In Romans 10, 15, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel of what? Peace. And bring glad tidings of good things. It's not that his feet are prettier than everybody else's. If that were the case, we'd have to have all of our preachers when we try them out and say, well, take shoes off, let's take a look at your feet. But you know what that means? When you see the man who brings the message of peace, you're glad to see him coming. You know, there's those kinds of folks. There's two kinds of people in the world. There's the peacemaker and there's the what? Troublemaker. Whenever you see the peacemaker come, you're glad to see him. Your heart lightens up. It's like, oh, I'm so glad to see you. Where have you been? I've missed you. When the troublemaker comes around the corner, you say, oh, no, here comes trouble. And so ask yourself, which do people think of you? And which really are you? 
Do you go out of your way to make peace with people? Or are you always digging and accusing and attacking and screaming at people? Are you a peacemaker or a troublemaker? Blessed are the feet of those who bring the gospel of peace. Because the world should be glad to see them come. You know what's sad? Look what's next. Blessed are the peacemakers. They should be called the sons of God. The peacemakers become the persecuted. Blessed are the persecuted for righteousness sake. They're persecuted by the world because they're from another world. They're from the spiritual realm. They're from the place that Jesus Christ wants us all to be. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. You know what those people are? The troublemakers. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. What happened to Isaiah? Tradition says he was cut in half. What happened to Jeremiah? He was thrown in a prison. He was thrown in a pit. He was left for dead. He was called a traitor by his own countrymen. He was hated by everyone, and yet today we call him a great prophet. But even those of us who think Jeremiah was great call him the weeping prophet. It wasn't a very fun job. Blessed are the peacemakers, but realize the peacemakers will be persecuted for righteousness' sake. You think peacemakers would be received with great joy by the world, but instead they stir up bitter animosity and hatred. And that's why Jesus taught us in Luke chapter 14, if we're going to be his disciple, we need to count the cost whether we have enough to finish. Is your faith strong enough to realize that 2 Timothy three twelve says, Yes, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And why is that? Well, Jesus tells us in John 15. He said, the reason why the world hates you is because you're not of the world, and I'm not of the world. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you too. And so listen to his words in verse 18. John 15, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. Now I realize that passage is spoken by Jesus to his 12 apostles. But it's true of any true disciple or follower of Jesus. But every apostle was persecuted to death. They put Jesus to death. They put his ambassadors to death. And if you give them the opportunity, they'll put you and me to death as well. Jesus said, A prophet is not without honor except his own country among his own kindred. And do you remember what city it was where Jesus was taken by the angry mob and almost thrown over the cliff? His hometown of Nazareth. Welcome home. Why do we have this persecution? Because the crime being committed by peacemakers is the crime of choosing to live righteously in an unrighteous world, and the world hates you for it. Look at John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, where Jesus explained what that's all about. In John 3, he says, This is the condemnation. That light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You see, that's the problem. We need to realize as Christians, we're going against the grain. We're going against the tide of public opinion. We're saying, I believe that what the Bible says is right is what's right, and the world will hate you for it. He goes on to say, For everyone practicing evil does not come to the light, but hates the light, lest their deeds should be made known. So that's why the world persecutes us as Christians. So that's our lesson that we got from Jesus. 
these beatitudes are wonderful. And the question we should ask is, is this me? Am I really a disciple of Jesus Christ? Are these things that Jesus has prescribed for us? Are they really what I'm all about? And I say that because every one of us needs to realize that being a disciple like this takes effort 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. The world is always trying to pull us away from these values and pull us into their world. We're not going to go there. Jesus said it is enough for a disciple to be like his teacher. And so are you a true disciple? Are you following Jesus by doing what he said? If so, then that's what you should be. But the disciples in the Lord's kingdom are not ordinary people by any means. Neither is the kingdom an ordinary kingdom, but a very special kingdom. And that's because our king is a very special king. So to become a disciple, you should be poor in spirit. You should be sad that the world is full of sin and that you're one of them. You should hunger and thirst for righteousness. And you know what the Bible says in 2 Peter 3? Peter said, we're looking for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. When we get to heaven, if you love righteousness, you'll be right where you belong. Blessed are the pure in heart. That's the fellow who says, I'm going to serve the Lord. And as we sometimes sing, no turning back, no turning back. Blessed are the meek because they sacrifice their rights and privileges and power for the well-being of others. Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers though the world shall persecute you. That's the kind of people we're called to be. If you're not a child of God or if you haven't lived as you should as a child of God, then this invitation might very well be for you. But as I've already said, this lesson isn't from Wayne Goff. If you don't like the message, then take it up with the messenger, not the messenger, but the author. Because I believe I've represented properly all the Beatitudes. And I encourage all of us as Christians, as disciples of Jesus Christ, to let this be your attitude. If you need to respond to the gospel, won't you come while we stand and sing?